Hey there, this is Erica Kelly, and you're listening to Southern Fraud True Crime. Today we have a special treat. Best-selling novelist and crime writer Laura Lippman is on the show. Since the publication of her first novel in 1997, Laura has won virtually every major accolade awarded to American crime writers, including the Edgar Award, the Agatha Award, the Nero Wolfe Award, and the Quill Award. But first, she was a reporter for 20 years, including 12 at the Baltimore Sun. Laura began writing novels while working full-time and published seven books about accidental P.I. Tess Monahan before leaving to write novels full-time in 2001. That series now has 12 books and is still going strong. Lately, she has earned much acclaim for her standalone novels, After I'm Gone, I'd Know You Anywhere, What the Dead Know, and Now Sunburn, which has gotten rave reviews for turning the noir genre on its head. The paperback comes out today, and I'm telling you, if you're looking for a page-turner to get a sunburn with at the beach, you cannot go wrong with Laura Littman's Sunburn. Sunburn is Laura's take on the modern noir novel. In a small beach town near the Maryland shore, two lovers begin a passionate summer affair, and also a cat-and-mouse game that will lead to betrayal and murder. One is playing a long game, but which one? Laura was born in Atlanta, but grew up in Baltimore. After college, she returned in 1989 and has lived there since with her family. She also keeps a home in New Orleans. We had a fun chat about her Southern roots, her literary inspirations, the feminist noir, and even a little bit about her next standalone novel. I hope you enjoy our chat as much as I did. Hi, Laura, and thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. I love your work, and I know that you've won so many prestigious awards, and I won't make you rattle them off, obviously, but <laughs> is there any that you feel are missing from your mantle? Uh, you mean ones that I yearn for? Yeah. Sure, there are lots that I yearn for. There are all sorts of international awards. I've done pretty well in North America, but there are still many, many, many to aspire to. That's wonderful. I like that you're always aspiring to something, always improving. And so you were born in Atlanta, correct? That is correct. I was born in Atlanta. My family is super Southern, which is something I don't think I really understood until adulthood, in part because our little branch of the family had moved north by the time I was two. My dad had taken a job in the Washington Bureau of the Atlanta Constitution, and from there, he went on to join the Baltimore Sun. And relative to all of our Georgia relatives, we were always very much the Yankees. <laughs> right. And I grew up with, yeah, even though Maryland is actually south south of the Mason-Dixon line. Exactly. But I grew up with the sense of being a Yankee. And then about sometime around the time I'm like in my 20s, I don't know, 24, 25, I think, well, I don't know, wait a minute. I actually have... Two Uncle Bubba's. Two <laughs> Uncle Bubba's. And I call one set of grandparents Big Mama and Big Daddy. And I call the other set of grandparents Sweetheart and Lulu. I think I'm pretty much a Southerner. Honey, you are very Southern. <laughs> I am actually very Southern. And when my husband and I, almost 10 years ago, ended up living part time in New Orleans, I felt as if it were something that had always been sort of lurking in me that was ready to come out. I felt very much at home in New Orleans. It's a beautiful and, place, and yeah. Very quickly acclimated to it, understood its rhythms and its pace. And I think that's because I am at heart a Southerner. Yeah, it's in the blood for sure. Oh, yeah. How do you think that speaks to your writing? I mean, your writing feels very Southern to me. And I mean, I agree with you. Maryland is in the South technically, but a lot of people don't feel that way. Well, the thing I always said about writing these novels set in Baltimore is that Baltimore has a Southern pace and Northern manners. <laughs> That's good. And it sums it up. I don't know what it means when you say that my writing feels Southern to you, and I would let you explain that. But I think that in my heart of hearts, I'm a Southerner because I have spent my adulthood coming to terms with a very tricky history. My mother's people were slaveholders, and that's an extremely complicated piece of knowledge, one that I didn't 
really bother to examine until when I was a reporter at the Baltimore Sun, I interviewed John Ball, who wrote Slaves in the Family. And you know, the key to that book is the sentence that every family in the South who had slaves has an, a lie they tell themselves. And he was very upfront about the fact that the lie his family told is that they were good to their slaves. And then he researched what it was to run a large rice plantation and realized that was almost impossible. Right. So that emboldened me to go and look at my own family history. My mother had always been doing the genealogy. And I knew that what I had heard about my family or what I thought I had heard was that they had had a very small number of slaves. But my mother, who was trained as a librarian, had done the research and her family owned more than 40 slaves, which is not a small number. Right. The lie had been that we only had a few slaves. No, no, we had more than 40. I had four ancestors who fought in the Civil War. Two were killed. Two went home. And embracing that, I mean, I think, so when we talk about being a Southerner, there's this unique experience within U.S. history in which you have to try to make peace with the fact that your people were very much on the wrong side and they did some bad things. There's some inherited guilt. Yes. Many people in the United States, a, a country that is full of people who are relatively new, who didn't come over in the 18th century or the 19th century, they kind of get a pass on that. They don't know what their ancestors were doing back in Europe or where they came from. So they get, they get sort of a new slate. I think part of being a Southerner is having to accept the fact that you have a known history that you can't pretend is without some pretty bad stuff. And I, I think for writing crime novels, that that's been an influence in that, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't think I write novels in which things are starkly good and evil. I'm not even sure I ever write about evil. I write a lot about ordinary people who go the wrong way. That's it. That's how I'm Southern. I think it is too. It's also a lot in your descriptions, the way the female internal dialogue, I think I relate to a lot and I see it a lot in Southern writing. Of course, I am a Southern woman. I could be projecting, but I do, I do really see that. It well, thank you. That's, um, I mean, I, I, one thing I noticed when I was living in New Orleans is that it was very easy for me to settle into the custom of having long conversations with everybody. <laughs> of not being in such a rush of understanding that if I went to the grocery store, that there would be, you know, some back and forth that was superfluous to the actual exchange of money for goods. <laughs> yeah. You don't just run in and out. No, and I, I think, I mean, maybe he would want to dispute this. I think it drove my husband a little bit crazy. He'd have like a transitional period where he would have to kind of adapt back to it. And it wasn't his natural speed. Um, but there was a part of me that just innately got it and understood how to do it. That's interesting. I love what you said about um, about being a reporter too. Do you think that gave you a sort of freedom when you became a novelist, or was it? Do you think it made things harder? Having been a reporter, yes, I think yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm fine. I'm definitely of mamming age. You know, as a kid growing up in Baltimore. I naturally used yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. And I sometimes had teachers in Baltimore public schools who thought I was being sarcastic oh. and would say, don't, don't you say that to me? And I was like, don't say yes, ma'am. <laughs> I couldn't imagine. It. Yeah, that's contrary to how you're raised for sure. You know, I think in becoming a novelist, I felt an immense liberation. But at the same time, I had learned so much as a reporter that carried over you know, I, my first reporting gig was in Texas. I moved to Waco, Texas, right out of college, and then went on to San Antonio, Texas. And I fell back on my southernness or my ability to, I never felt 100% southern. And again, that was sort of the rap because relative to my cousins, I was not. And they sort of always made me feel like a Yankee. And I've always felt like I've been sort of I'm neither one nor the other. I mean, I'm I'm definitely not a 100% Southerner, but nor am I a Yankee. I'm definitely not a Yankee either. And so, you know, I had that sense of having, I felt like a spy. 
I felt like a spy in the North and I felt like a spy in the South. And I felt like in the South and particularly in Texas that I could pretend to be someone that I wasn't quite to my advantage. That's interesting. So you're hiding in plain sight. Yeah. I knew how to speak respectfully to people in power. I knew how to pretend to be deferential. I knew what was expected of me and how, you know, it was definitely very much the old adage about you'll get more flies with honey than you will with vinegar. And I, and I used that honey. I used that honey to really good effect as a young reporter. You know, came up to Baltimore, which really is a, a city on the cusp of these two cultures. It's like all mixed up together here. You just can't tell which is which. And, you know, that goes back to the idea of Southern pace and Northern manners. You know, I think I continue to be that person on the cusp. I just think that's so interesting. You have a, you have a foot in both sides. It gives you a really interesting perspective. It, it does. I was thinking I was just over um, in the UK and I go over there to do a crime festival. And several years ago, I mean, we're going back, I think about 10 years, there was a big time writer who was supposed to be at the festival. And for weather reasons, there's a lot of flooding in England. He just didn't show up. And they had to put together something at the last minute. And they put together this, you know, very whimsical, meant for laughs debate about who's better, the Brits or the Americans. And I was one of the plants on the team. And my job was to get up and to speak in a Southern accent. And, and people in England were just bowled over by the fact that I knew how to do this. <laughs> it's always there. And it really comes out. Um, it comes out. I think it's coming out a little bit right now. I was going to say, I imagine the more you speak to a Southerner, the more, the more Southern you sound. It, it comes out when I drink. I will admit that. I get <laughs> much more Southern when I drink. And I've always used the word y'all, always. And people I think that's have, becoming universal, thank goodness. <laughs> it's the English ustedes. It is, you know, one of the few plurals that you can employ that does not indicate gender. So it's a marvelous word. It's one of the best words that are a combination of two words, calling okay. people who put the apostrophe between the A and the L and y'all. Oh, dear God. Oh, dear God. I know what you mean. I mean, well, you mean. bless their heart. It's the only possible <laughs> thing to say. I can't stand I it can't when people misspell, misspell it. No, it, it's really painful. But no, I, you know, I, I have, um, I'm very active on Twitter and there's a good portion. Uh, I'm very active in what we would call writer Twitter. And there's a good portion of, writer Twitter that I follow that's very Southern, uh, Wiley Cash, David Joy, Jack Pendarvis, Ace Atkins. I mean, these are real Southerners, um, the crime writer Jeff Abbott in Texas. And I feel very comfortable with all these people. I was going to say, and Karen Slaughter and a few other ladies like that. Oh, yeah. I follow all of you guys. I love that you have, you both have long running recurring characters. And then you're able to do these awesome standalone novels. Yeah. I understand your next novel isn't a test novel. The next novel is not a test novel, but it touches on sort of the test prehistory. Um, her mother is in there. Her uncle oh, Donald is in there. There's been a character floating through the test series, at least the early books, who is named Spike. And Spike was a mysterious person who had attached himself to Tess's family and no one was sure exactly where he came from or how they had ended up with him. And the only thing we know about him is that he committed a felony and therefore can't have a liquor license in the state of Maryland. And in the next book, which will be coming out in the summer of 2019, the story of what that felony is is finally explained and that all these little past stories are, are, are shown I mean, in my head, it's all connected. I was going to say that's exciting. Yeah. I mean, Tess has shown up in some of the standalones. Some of the characters from the standalones have crossed over into the Tess novels. I mean, Baltimore's a small, big city, and that's actually correct. That's how it works here. 
that you would expect all those people to know each other. So to pretend otherwise seems very silly to me. That's interesting. Southern towns are often called that. It's a, it's a big, small town. Well, Baltimore has a nickname, which is Smaltimore. <laughs> and it's incredible. I didn't come up with that, but I stole it. And it's incredibly accurate. Yeah, that's great. I guess we need to go ahead and go on into it. The reviews for Sunburn are just incredible. I read one. Um, Harlan Coben said it was your nerviest novel yet. And Gillian Flynn called it a gleaming noir gem. Have you always loved the noir genre? Always. And I was very frustrated that I couldn't seem to write in that tone or vein until now. Oh, I think you nailed it. Thank you. I think when I started writing, I was obviously younger and obviously female. I think there is bred into many women this desire to please and to not be too threatening. And I think my voice when I started out writing crime fiction was that of a person who had been taught to please others, to make little jokes and not be too scary. And for a long time, even as my voice changed and the books changed and the range changed, that was still sort of the default. I completely understand that. Yeah, I think most women would. And with this book for the first time, there was a sense that, well, what would happen if I wrote a very unsparing and very unsentimental novel? Well, you turn the tables around. I hope so. Yeah. I, I'm not a sentimental writer. I, I mean, almost to a fault, to a literal fault. I enjoy sentiment in my own reading and viewing habits sometimes, but I'm deeply skeptical of people who create work that kind of lets the readers and the viewers off the hook. I think any book or TV show or movie that brings up difficult and provocative subjects but assures the reader, viewer, we're not talking about you. You, you're perfect. You, you've never had a bad thought. You've never had a bad moment. You're always on the right side. You've never unconsciously had a racist thought. You've never had a sexist thought. You are always, always good. I love you. And now come read this book about people who aren't as evolved as you. I agree too. I call them cry movies. Um, to me, that's manufactured sentimentalism. Well, it's easy. Mm -hmm. It allows us to mm -hmm. sit there and deal with the problems of the world as if the problems of the world are all caused by someone other than us, someone different from us. And we pretend that we live in worlds where everybody is, is so evolved and so wonderful and just so appalled and offended and worried about the people who aren't as wonderful as we are. Now, I come out of journalism, and there was an old journalism saying that journalists should um, comfort the afflicted and uh, afflict the comfortable. And I kind of write novels that way. I like that. I like readers to have a moment here or there where they kind of squirm a bit and think, gee, I hope I'm not that person. I hope I've never had that moment of being that rude to someone I considered my lesser, whether it was a race issue or a class issue. I understand what you mean. I might be a, a thousand times more successful if I wouldn't do that, but <laughs> I just can't be other than who I am. Well, I do it the easy way. I think that's one of the things is, I really liked Polly. I feel like she's the sort of person that it's not that things happen to her. She makes things happen. I liked her too. I mean, she's ruthless. She's out to survive. She is utterly intent on getting what she needs. But as her motivations become clearer by the end of the book, what she wants and what she needs is actually defensible within our mainstream culture. I totally agree. Yeah. What would you have her do? You know, I, I mean, I sort of feel like that's the question at the end. When you get to the end of the book and you understand everything Polly has done and the reasons she's done it, given her history, and again, having to be so vague because it's a big part of reading the book, it's finding out her story. What would you have her do differently? Oh, no, I completely agree. Yeah. And I would be curious to hear someone try to come up with an option for Polly that actually makes sense. I think if they did, it would not be nearly as feminist or interesting. 
I hope not. Could you tell us a little bit about the premise of the novel without giving too much away? Sure. Um, it's at its heart, it's an inversion of the postman always rings twice. Mm-hmm. I was I love James Kane, and I was thinking about what would it be like if you just flip the genders and the beautiful stranger passing through is a woman and the person stuck behind the stove is a man. And that was where I started. I mean, obviously it doesn't line up perfectly with Postman Always Rings Twice, but it opened up the various Pandora boxes I wanted to open. It was enormous fun for someone like me who's very talky and very verbal, very introspective, very analytical, to write someone who's completely the opposite. Yeah, she's the mystery, yes. Yeah, she's a, she's a woman of silences. Which is unusual. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> she's very in control of what she says and how she says it. She knows her plans. She knows what she wants. Um, and I found I found her really interesting. It was almost as if I didn't make her up. To me, it was sort of like she wandered into my office one day and asked me to write her biography. Uh, you know, it's almost one of my favorite books of all time is The Speed Queen by Stuart O'Nan, which is about a woman who has committed many crimes and ended up on death row and is going to be executed. And her final gambit is to sell her life story to Stephen King. And the conceit of the novel is this is the tape that Stephen King will receive to write, you know, a book based on it. And I, I think I felt that way when I was writing. I felt as if, you know, my own speed queen had walked into my office and was sitting there telling me her life story and trusting me to make something out of it. That makes sense to me. And she's she's so interesting. And somehow she conveys everything without saying anything. And I don't know if it's her internal dialogue. Yeah, there's definitely something that speaks to me. I mean, I like her. I don't expect everyone who reads the novel to like her. And there's some, you know, hard realities in the novel. And she is a woman who has abandoned a small child. That's what you find out at the very beginning of the novel, that she's walked away from her husband and her child during a vacation. And all the men around her are forever saying she's unnatural. Right. And I just thought it was very interesting to contemplate, well, you know, who's to say what a natural woman is? And if anyone gets to say it, or is it all these men around her? I don't know if she's natural or unnatural, but I know the men who decide to judge her don't have a clue. Right. Well, she's doing something that they've done for centuries, basically. (laughs) Yeah, they don't even put that together. They don't put that together that she sees the prerogative that they think is theirs. Oh, no, I totally agree. Tell me a little about the character of Adam. In in my notes on, I've got just on page four, I put, I already, I put, I already hate him. (laughs) No, I mean that in a funny way. Yeah. You know, Adam Bosk, they're, basically two main characters in this novel, but a lot of secondary characters. There are a lot of spoilers and it's hard to talk about the book, but when I do talk about it, I always say, look, if you don't understand that Polly and Adam are getting together, I mean, by all means, assign power of attorney to someone else in your family. You're not fit to be walking around, you know, and Oh, for sure. Yeah. In the noir novels of James Cain, which I adored, the characters come together super fast in Postman Always Strings Twice, Cora and Frank are having sex within minutes of meeting. Mm-hmm. Double Indemnity, Walter and Phyllis are plotting her husband's murder, you know, very quickly after they've met. And and I love those books, but I was interested in a slower burn. And That's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. I like Adam. Oh, I do too. I just did it first. I don't think you're supposed to at first, though. Yeah. Well, you know, he's... Someone to be skeptical of at first. I think in some ways he turns out to be the most honorable person in the book. Maybe. I don't know. It's not for me to say in some ways. But he, it's so tough to talk about this book without spoilers. But Adam. Oh, I know. Well, God, I hate to quote my own husband on this. He's definitely a man with a coat. He's operating according to principles that he's developed for himself. And within that framework, he is an honorable person. And. Just as Polly is reticent and kind of unknowable, he's that guy who's always passing through, moving on. You know, you you try to get connected to him at your own peril, as more than one woman in the novel finds out. 
But she doesn't try, and that's what makes her interesting. Yes, Polly's not trying at all. (laughs) Polly's not looking, which, of course, is unthinkable to men. It's inconceivable that there's an attractive woman who's, you know, sitting at the next bar still who doesn't actually have men on her mind. What could she possibly be thinking about? Oh, it's got to be about the men. (laughs) (laughs) That's in my notes, too, that you, before we really get to know her, you reveal her character kind of through the eyes of men. And so you get a skewed viewpoint of her in the beginning, at least in the beginning. No, it's, it's a very definite choice that the, the book begins with Adam looking at her. The book, has, uh, the book had a different opening that ended up being jettisoned for a lot of reasons. And part of it was that I was always hoping that readers would go into the book wondering, well, who said those words? You know, is it Adam? Is it Polly? Is it Adam or is it Polly? And initially the book was going to begin everybody hates me, you will too. And then you would have the story. And then the last line of the book was going to be told you so. (sighs) Yeah. When I got to the end of the story, it's like, well, I don't hate this person. No, not at all. I don't think it's reasonable to hate this person. So those, those lines have to go. They're not true. I think the person who says that hates themselves trying to be tender, obscure and feels a large sense of blame, even though I would argue that it's somewhat unearned, now getting into the very, you know, obscure spoiler category where I'm trying not to get too much. (laughs) But yeah, it was definitely a choice that the book begins with Adam looking at Polly because, boy, we talk about the male gaze all the time. Mm -hmm. Polly has been the subject of the male gaze since she was 14 years old. And in my head, she may not be the most classically beautiful woman who ever lived, but she's one of those women who has that odd combination of vulnerability and invulnerability. She seems to need men, and yet at the same time, she seems not to need them, and that sort of drives them crazy. You know, that's what they can never let be. I feel like I have a line from Philip Roth echoing in my head from one of his books that never gets talked about, uh, which is the second novel, When She Was Good. And I think I've got this right. Maybe I'm thinking of another novel, but I think it's, you know, a girl saying to a boy, please just let me be. And then and from that moment on, he never could. Right. Um, I'm going to quote you. I'm going to quote you a little bit. There's something about her, a stillness, a capacity for quiet. And then also she learned to freeze like a deer. One of the things I found really compelling was the metaphor of silence and stillness kind of equals hunting. Yeah. Okay. So um, the hunting thing is kind of interesting in that I have been working out with a personal trainer I think it's going on 15 years. Oh, wow. I, I know that when we, st- I'm, I'm old enough to be his mom. And when we started out, Todd was a young guy in his 20s. And now he's a man in his 30s with a wife and two children. But he hunts deer. And, you know, we talk a lot about his hunting and what it's like. And, and he has told me about the incredible stillness and silence and that that's really what he's there for. I mean, he shoots deer with a bow and arrow and he brings them home and he has the venison to keep them through the winter. But it's as much about just sitting in a tree for hours upon hours. And he finds it incredibly meditative and restive and loves it. And so, you know, I, I stole that as writers do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do. Yeah. That's what we do. You know, as Joan Didion and say, we're always selling somebody out. That's, Oh, I love her. Yeah. So do you think, to me, I went back and forth with, with, is Polly the hunter or is she the hunted? Because she was kind of both. I think you should absolutely be going back and forth with that. I think at different moments in Polly's life, she is the hunted. And at other times, she has been the hunter. And I don't think it was always that for her. But it's something she's definitely come into. And I, mean, I think of it as a game of cat and mouse. But it's who's the cat? Who's the mouse? And does it change? And I think it changes back and forth throughout this novel. And it's not just Adam and Polly. I think there are multiple people in this novel and not just men. And they take turns. Are you the cat or are you the mouse? 
Do you think you're the cat and you turn out to be the mouse, which is probably the worst possible thing of all, to think that you're the person who's so on top of things and find out that, no, you don't have a clue what you're really up to. And I liked that idea of all these different people with very different agendas. There are a lot of people with agendas in this novel. Yeah, there really are. Yeah, ranging from small to large. And you find out that all sorts of agendas can be lethal. Almost all of them. You had one quote, and I I used to be in the service industry, and I just love it. It cracked me up so much. Barmaids and waitresses who flirt this overtly make me a little nervous. Bringing a man food or beer is intimate. I stole that. I stole that from James Kane. <laughs> I should have recognized it. Mildred learns really <laughs> early on that um, her flirtation should be on the very mild side, that bringing a man food is flirtation enough. I haven't read that since college, but it's 100% true. As a yeah. nice bartender and a server, I, yeah, they have an immediate intimateness with you that's uncomfortable almost. Yeah. I waited tables the first six to nine months I was working as a full-time reporter in Waco, Texas, because I didn't make enough money to get by. So I worked at um, this small, not very good Italian restaurant in Waco. Go go figure that the Italian restaurant in Waco wasn't fabulous. <laughs> and I worked lunch hours <laughs> and it was so interesting. Everything about it was interesting to me. Um, the all the dynamics, the the power dynamics between people who go to restaurants and the people who serve them there will never not be fascinating to me. I completely agree, and I, I think it's a little bit my experience. But unless you've ever been a server, I think you always only see it one way. I think being a server is something that every person should be. I did it. My husband did it. Um, his son, my stepson, was a barista for a while, so he's done it. I think it should almost be mandatory for people to work in a service industry for at least at least one summer. I could not agree more. Well, I think it would make people treat servers a lot better if nothing else. One would hope. Yeah, but I, I think I think you learn a lot. You learn a lot about how to handle people, how to think on your feet. But, but yeah, there's a lot of good reasons. I completely agree. Let's see. I had a few quotes here that just, I loved. Oh, and Polly's mother prefers white, mis- white Christmas lights. <laughs> <laughs> so does mine, and now I do. <laughs> the, multicolored, the multicolored ones are tacky, and so did my mother. There was a little shopping center in Baltimore that did white lights, and she just felt that was the epitome of class. And I'm always kind of interested in those things that mothers pass down to their daughters. And we we try to shake them, but we can't quite. That's what it, that's what cracked me up about it. Because, yeah, it is those little things that you think, oh, no, I'll have color lights when I'm a grown woman. My tree is all white. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 my mother definitely persuaded me that all white lights are the classy way to go. That's That's what really elegant people do. Yeah, I hear you there. Well, I know one of your books became a movie, Every Secret Thing, which I really liked it. Thank you. How was that experience for you? Oh, it it was pretty much ideal. I had the very good luck of writing a book that was optioned by the actress Frances McDormand. I love her. She's amazing. And her intent was to play one of the roles, but it took over 10 years to get the movie made. And at some point she just said, look, I'll just be a producer. And the role that she thought she might play was ended up being played by Diane Lane. Not that much younger, but I guess just that much younger enough. But it was such a honorable, honorable, is that the word I want? They, they, the, the movie really honored the book and its intentions to the extent in which when I went to see it and I saw it while sitting in the audience of the Tribeca Film Festival, it's like, that is the biggest downer I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Like, wow, I'm really dark. And again, you know, that that refusal to want to offer, I mean, I guess a big part of sentiment is uplift. I'm not really interested in uplift. I mean, I don't mind if it's in the books, if it occurs organically, if you if the book ends on a somewhat positive note. And to my mind, Sunburn kind of does in its own weird way that those final lines 
are about happiness or about having known happiness, however fleeting it might have turned out to be. But so I had this great, Very great experience, experience with every secret thing. It was really nice. And um, I can only hope that going forward, any other experiences I might have will be the same. That was my follow-up question. Anything in the works? There is something in the works for Sunburn, and I'm not allowed to talk about it. I mean, I have I have <laughs> sold the rights to some terrific, smart people, and they have an amazing idea, and there might be an amazing person attached to play poly, but it's all Ooh. it's all Ooh. still in that up in the air place where it could also all not happen. Right. So for now right. there's there's nothing to say. I think Sunburn is very cinematic. And even in the sense that it even not just movies but television is doing so many great things right now. I think of big little lies and yeah I, sort of television thing. is fantastic right now and I would be happy to end up in either in either category, uh, I'm pretty down to earth about the whole, what's the word I'm looking for? I, about adaptation. You know, I, I know all the places where projects can die. I've mm -hmm. actually had many projects die at every single way station. I've, I've had an adaptation of my Tess Monaghan no novels almost make it to the pilot stage. And then that didn't happen. And I've had other things optioned. I had one book optioned. And it took so long to draw up the contract that by the time the contract was finalized, the producer already knew he couldn't get a deal for it because he'd been trying the whole time, all these months that the contract was like moving through various legal stages. By the time I finally signed it, he had just given up. <laughs> he, he was so, I guess, apparently so demoralized, he didn't even bother to sign the contract. <laughs> So I got oh a gosh. I got a check and the rights immediately reverted back to me. It was basically like, here's your money. I don't even care if we ever execute this contract. It can be demoralizing and humbling, but yeah, I don't mind as much as most people. That it's worth it. I, I think I'm really low key about it, I, and since I don't really have an interest in doing the work myself, I would like to write a pilot script for the adaptation of my series and create the Bible and then persuade a really smart showrunner to come along and do all the rest of the work. But I was not made to work on a television show. It involves a lot more collaborative work than I wish to do. It involves longer hours than I wish to work. I have the, I don't know if you call it the advantage. It's just the reality. I know how hard it is. So I, I'm not the least bit romantic about it. And I really like working by myself at my own pace on novels. There's nothing wrong with that. I like your honesty. No, but I mean, I have friends like Megan Abbott, who is a fantastic novelist, who also is trying to adapt her own stuff for television. And I admire the heck out of her. I think she's amazing. But I also... I'm a huge fan, but yeah. She's amazing, but she's also significantly younger than I am, and she doesn't have a young kid at all. I was going to say, that changes a lot when you have a family at home. Yeah, it really it does. changes a lot. Well, this was so much fun. I really enjoyed this talk. And tell us again when the paperback is coming out. The paperback goes on sale in the U.S. on July 31st. That is the day this interview is coming out. So the paperback is out today. Yay, fantastic. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to talk about? I don't want to give too much away, but I always want to cover everything. I don't think there's anything I would would add to it. It's been a really great conversation, and I, I loved that I got to talk to you. Well, great. I loved it, too, and you're welcome back anytime. Thank you. I'll take you up on that. I really appreciate it. Well, you have a good night. You too, Erica. Southern Fried True Crime is written and produced by me, Erica Kelly. The original graphic art is by Coley Horner, and Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio. Special thanks to Laura Littman, a Southerner at heart, for taking time out of her busy schedule to talk to me today. Don't forget to jump on Amazon or head to your nearest bookstore to pick up your paperback copy of Sunburn. It's one of my favorite reads of this summer. As always, if you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. 
You can also listen directly from Spreaker, my network online, or their app. And I'm also on Stitcher, Overcast, CastBox, and many other podcatchers. If you're interested in supporting the show, I have a Patreon page with with many different rewards for different levels of donation. Or you can visit my website, southernfriedtruecrime.com, where you can make a one-time donation just by hitting the donate button. If you have any comments, corrections, or suggestions, you can email me at southernfriedtruecrime at gmail.com. I love hearing from you guys, and I'm always looking for new cases, so please feel free to reach out. I'm also all over social media. Just search the show name in your favorite platform if you'd like to connect with me there. If you're interested in discussing any Southern Fried episodes or the authors I interview, come check out my discussion group. It's linked to my Southern Fried True Crime Facebook page. I would love to hear your thoughts. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.